right, let's open our Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Hey, if you have been around the church for very long at all, you might wonder, why does the church do the things they do? Right? So, um, or maybe you might wonder, where in the world did that idea come from? Right? I mean, you just might wonder what is going on. You'll notice a vast amount of differences depending on the church that you attend, on the way that churches do the things that they do. In some churches, there are very strict ways of doing things. They have a very clear order of service. They pray to start. They read the prayer. They sing a cappella together, certain hymns of the faith, and certainly hymns that are found in the Bible. They will quote a confessional statement, uh, read another prayer. They'll give a short sermon, and then they'll close it out with the Lord's Supper. Other churches are on the other end of the spectrum. It's more like a free-for-all, right? I mean, you show up, you kind of wonder what's going to happen today. Everybody, they know that the Bible says everybody's to come to the table with something to sing or share or pray or teach. And so they take that so seriously that there are no, there's nothing off limits. Nothing is out of order. And then there's some of us that are in the middle of the road, right? We, we try to blend a few key elements, we sing, we preach, we pray, we take the Lord's Supper, and we have some kind of spontaneous elements that go on. But here's the question I want to ask you is, why? Why does the church or a church do what they do? And they should have a definition for why they do what they do, and there should be a target audience for what you're shooting for in the church. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. In our last sermon in 1 Corinthians 14, and as we read the text in a minute, you're going to understand why I'm so glad this is our last sermon in 1 Corinthians 14, right? This has been the very challenging chapter for us, but here's what I hope we'll learn. This is the big idea. It's on the back of your outline. Um, If you're new with us, we try to put a big idea up usually every Sunday, and here's the big idea. Love and order in church matters to God. Love reveals the power of Christ at work in his church. And order reveals the character of God. Let me say that one more time. Love and order in church matters to God. Love reveals the power of Christ at work in his church. And order reveals the character of God. So let's stand together. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 40. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 40. And we stand because we want to honor God's word. We believe it's inspired and God breathed, don't we, church? Amen. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for a challenging text, because what this does for us is it causes us to lean in more to you, and thank you that your word is is abundantly clear on order in the church. You've not been silent on this issue, and I pray this morning that we would learn and grow and be affected so that we we can go out into this world and we can represent Jesus really well. But Father, more than the odd things in the text, would you draw our attention to the God of order? And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So once again, we are confronted with a really challenging text in 1 Corinthians 14. You can see why I've said that 1 Corinthians 14 is the most challenging text chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. 
The last two sermons in this, cha- in this chapter, we've looked at two gifts, the gift of prophecy and the gift of foreign languages or tongues, remarkably tough sledding. But I can tell you this, the Lord has been really kind to us. And we come to another challenging text this morning, especially when you read, let the women keep silent in the churches for it's shameful to them to speak in the churches. And I can't wait to cover that. <laughs> right? And you can't wait for me to cover that. Right? But let me just say this, in the midst of really tough sledding and challenging topics, here's something I don't want us to miss. Our God, your God, has not left you or us alone in the church to make up our own rules. God cares so deeply for his church and his people and his house, that's evidenced by the death of his precious son in this chapter is another evidence or icing on the cake if you will that God cares about the church let's not miss that he cares about what goes on here on a Sunday morning he cares what goes on in my brother's churches in the Philippines when they gather together on a Sunday morning and so again just by way of reminder this is what we're going to learn again this is what the hope is that we'll hear As we go through the sermon today, love and order in church matters to God. Love reveals the power of Christ at work in his church, and order reveals the character of God. So let's start with that first point in your outline, uh, order in the church, but I want you to put a little phrase before it, love and order in the church. I think that fits better with the point. So love and order in the church, I think it fits really well. So throughout chapters 11 through 14, The Apostle Paul has been really concerned about the fact that the Corinthian Christians thought too highly of themselves and they thought too highly of their spiritual gifts. And this arrogance and this misunderstanding about their spiritual gifts caused chaos in their church services. And so if you were to go to a first century church service in Corinth, here's what it might look like. Usually it was at a larger home of a wealthy individual. And when you walked in the door, you usually had men separated on one side and women were on the other. In the city of Corinth, it was separated by something else. It was separated by socioeconomics, how wealthy people were. So on the front, you might have the rich men sit up front. The, other, the rich ladies would sit on the other side. The poor men would not just be in the back. They'd actually be in the foyer. And the poor ladies would be farther back. So you can imagine... What is happening in this church when Paul is so concerned over the division and the separation of their church? And then when the church service started, the chaos ensued. If somebody had a foreign language to share, they'd just pop up and start talking. Corinth was a city with many foreign languages, so they were used to hearing languages all over, But people would just start talking all over the service. And then if somebody had an exhortation, they'd just interrupt and talk over the top of the foreign speaker. And if someone had a prophecy that they wanted to share, they just shared it whenever they wanted, however they wanted, and it didn't matter what order was happening in the church. You can imagine the chaos. And if anybody new to the church walked in the door, they had no idea what was happening here. It'd be like watching the culmination of a circus when they let all the the animals out to go play. And you're sitting back going, what is going to happen here? Now, what's fascinating in chapters 11 through 14 is Paul's burden for this church. You'll notice that something that he does. Rather than just tell the Corinthian Christians to stop using their spiritual gifts, which you and I would have done, right? You see all the chaos and all the gifts being used. You said, listen, just stop. Zip it. Be quiet. Sit down. Don't use any gifts until we get this thing figured out. Paul doesn't do that at all. Rather, he tells him, let's take the spiritual gifts and let's put them in order in the church service. Let's figure out how they're supposed to fit when we gather together. This is remarkably significant because Paul could have said, No spiritual gifts whatsoever, but that's not what he does. He said there are spiritual gifts. They're to be used in order in the church service. That's really significant. So Paul's burden is that these these Christians, and us as well, would put spiritual gifts in their rightful place. Spiritual gifts are secondary to the gift of Jesus Christ to us. We just cannot miss that point. Spiritual gifts do not reveal if a person is spiritual or if they're godly. 
No, faith in Jesus reveals if we're spiritual. Trusting that Jesus is your Savior is primary to your spiritual gift. And spiritual gifts don't reveal if you're a mature Christian. Rather, we've learned from 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter on love, that Christ-like love reveals Christian maturity. But further, in chapters 1, 11 through 14, Paul's burden for the church is even farther. Now listen really clearly. What he's getting at is spiritual gifts don't make the church service reveal God. Love manifested in the church and order in the church reveals God. That is remarkably important. Now see, often our tendency is when we come to church is to think God is revealed when something miraculous happens or something out of the ordinary happens or if the worship service is really lively. You know, if the worship team's really got it going on, the pastor tells us a really funny story, if he's really engaging, I really feel like the presence of God was there. What does the Apostle Paul say? When love is manifested in the church and order and peace is in the church service, God is revealed. Notice how he does this in the text. At the end of verse 14, Paul gave us instructions and certain limitations on speech gifts, prophecy and tongues, and even told us the number of them, two and no more than three. Now you can imagine the shock to the system this would be on the Corinthian people who when they came to church, they thought all bets were off. I mean, just no limitations, do whatever you wanted. And Paul said, hey, listen, we're not talking 22 people here speaking. We're talking two, no more than three, each in their own turn. And them thinking, wait a minute, we're really experiencing the presence of God. And Paul's saying, actually, you're not. And you're not revealing God. But then he tells us why this order is put in place in verse 33 and verse 40. Read it very clearly. For the reason being, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And then he closes the chapter with, chapter, with verse 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. Telling us that when God puts rules in place for the church... For our gathering, he does it because it reveals something about him. That's remarkably important. God doesn't just give arbitrary rules. He doesn't just tell us two more than three, something like a good number. You know, three is kind of the number of the Trinity. That seems really good. Let's do the number three. That's not how God works. God says there should be order in the church because order reveals the character of God. Now, just for a moment, let's think how important that is for us right now. Right where we are, 21st century, Roseburg, Oregon, living in America, where there are Christianity stuff going on everywhere. No matter what side of the aisle you come from about spiritual gifts, there is something here for us to learn. You might be a hyper-charismatic, meaning, meaning you might agree with what went on in the church in Corinth, and you would love to see that kind of thing happen in your church. When you walk in the door, all bets are off, let's just do whatever. And let's sort it all out later, you know, let's not treat the Holy Spirit like he's the weird uncle we don't want to come out at a party, right? Let's let the Holy Spirit loose. Or you might be somebody who's open but cautious. You know, you believe in spiritual gifts, but I don't know, let's kind of figure that out. Or you could be hyper skeptical of spiritual gifts and especially some spiritual gifts, but no matter where you land on that spectrum, Paul has already told us how to act. In chapter 13, verse one, he said that no matter what gifts we might have, love must rule our hearts toward other people. No matter where we land on that spectrum, love must rule rule our hearts. And he's made it really clear that when we come to church, all things must be done for the building up of the church. Made it really clear. Paul is not ambiguous about this. And the reason Paul tells us this is because when we love one another through our differences of opinions or different way we think about these things, love reveals the power of God at work in us to a crazy, divided world that's out there. 
Friends, you, you know as well as I do, we don't have to talk about it much, but this cancel culture that goes on where you cancel everyone and everything that disagrees with you or your ideas. You just rule them out. That's how the world operates. Division is what is eaten for breakfast. Our politicians and media specialize in it, and it's the poison that is flooding the streets of Main Street. As the great theologian Charles Barkley said, He said, by nature, white people and black people generally get along pretty well. We live, But the people who don't live on our streets and who don't know us very well are the media and politicians, and every time they divide us, it's just greasing the sides of their pockets. And yet, what do you have every time you open the Apple News Feed or you flip up on whatever your favorite app is for news? You see division everywhere. Why is that? The reason for that is because from the very beginning of time, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they immediately started fighting. You saw gender conflict, and you saw interpersonal conflict, and you see it culminated in Genesis 4 when Cain rises up and kills his own brother. Well, yeah, what has Paul shown us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through 14 about differences? He's shown us that the love of Christ and the power of Christ is so rich and so amazing and so transformative that people with radically different gifts, radically different opinions about the gifts, can love each other because love has won our hearts because Christ has won our hearts. And when we love like this, it shows a world out there that there's only one power in the universe that can bring genuine unity with one another and only one power in the universe that can have genuine concern for another person's well-being, even if I disagree with him. See, this means in our church, we're going to have a smattering of opinions about spiritual gifts. Believe me, as the pastor of this church and preaching through the last few sermons, I know there's a smattering of different opinions on this right? We'll have vastly different gifts. We'll even disagree on how those gifts might serve the church. But, but one thing is non-negotiable. One thing is non-negotiable. Love must win the day because Christ has won our hearts. That's non-negotiable. Don't miss that. Love reveals the power of God at work in us. But that's not the only thing Paul said that reveals God in the church service. He said love is important, but so is order in the church service. Peace comes when things are done in an orderly fashion with love for God and love for others. Right, parents, if you want to create peace in your children's lives, give them structure. Why? Order creates peace when it's done with love. So so why in the church do we sing and then we speak each in order and each in their own time? Why is it when Kai was up leading today, I'm not just running up and saying things from the pulpit and so are other people and it's just chaotic. Why does that not happen? It's not just because it'd be weird. It's because that order reveals something. Each doing it in their own time reveals something. Why is it that leaders of the church are to protect the church from chaos that might go on in the church service? It's because order reveals the God of order. And it also reveals something else. It reveals that we worship the God of order, not the gods of confusion and chaos. Gordon Fee put it like this, and I found a misprint on this quote, so I'm going to read the correction Uh, Just so it may be confusing, but I'm going to read it. So here's what Gordon Fee wrote about this point in Corinth. This point, order in the church has to do with the character of God, more than likely in contrast to the deities of the cults, whose worship was characterized by frenzy and disorder. The theological point is crucial. The character of one's deity is reflected in the character of one's worship. That is really a good statement. The Corinthians must therefore cease worship that reflects the pagan deities more than the God whom they have come to know through the Lord Jesus Christ. God is neither characterized by disorder nor the cause of it in the assembly. 
See, when we allow chaos in the church and division in the church over disagreements, we're really revealing who we worship. We really are. We're showing that where our hearts really land. So love and order in the church reveal God's character. It's remarkably important. And this must matter to us. And I can tell you this, CLF, by God's grace, it matters to you. And we are so grateful for that. It would be, we, we as leaders would feel some of your wrath if we let things get disorderly here. We have felt held accountable by you, but more importantly, to be honest with you, we feel accountable by God. Let's look at the second, second point then, is gender roles in the church. This is the part you've been waiting for, right? I mean, it's like, when, when is he going to get to this? You know, but I think you're going to be a tad disappointed. And here's, here's why I say that. This section is a culmination of Paul's discussion from 1 Corinthians 11. And, and one of the things that's challenging when we preach through the Bible like we do here is we haven't covered 1 Corinthians 11 in, in a couple months. So you're probably going, what is in 1 Corinthians 11? That's for your own study. I'll send out in the musings this week the sermon from 1 Corinthians 11 called Mutual Respect. I'll also tie it in with another couple sermons called Gender Roles in the Church that will help you put more of this framework together. So imagine when you're in the church in Corinth and the letter came from Paul, here's what they did. The pastor stood up and he read the the letter in its entirety. So in a matter of three minutes, you would have connected Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians 11 about women's roles in the church service to this section in 1 Corinthians 14, right? So, so when you read this, and we're going to read it, verses 34 and 35, that the women should keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask uh, their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. You go, man, dude, Paul. I mean, you're just really giving women the bad, I mean, you're slapping them around here. This isn't cool. So we've got to understand the context of what Paul's getting at here. Okay, there's a, this is a challenging section, no doubt. It's challenging grammatically. It's challenging in its syntax. It's challenging in its language. It's challenging everywhere. And it's challenging because it does look like Paul comes down hard on ladies. And especially in our culture of the hashtag Me Too movement, everybody gets wigged out when women are mentioned. So we've got to, we can't ignore this section of scripture. But it's also challenging because in that section in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said something else. And here's what Paul said. He said that women or a wife can pray or prophesy in the church service. And she does it with her head covered. It's, it's a symbol of her submission to her husband in the church service. So, so the question really is, why now? Why is Paul bringing this up now? And what is he saying here? In order to understand this, we first got to do what we've always done when we study a text like this. What was going on in Corinth that would make Paul do this? What was happening here? Right? Well, this church, and we talked about it, was an unusual place. In Corinth, there was this really big temple on the backdrop of the city, and it was filled with temple prostitutes and temple prophetesses. And these prophetesses were leading the worship of these pagan deities everywhere. When they had their, their celebrations, these women were leading the charge, and it was, it was a chaotic and frenzied event, as Gordon Fee pointed out earlier in his commentary. And you also had this, this chaos going on where anybody could take the floor at any given time. Well, imagine these prophetesses coming to faith in Christ and landing in a worship service in a church. What do you think they're going to bring with them? The exact same thing. When they came to faith in Christ, they entered the church, and they brought the same chaos with them, thinking that's the way you worship a deity. That deity was chaotic. This deity in the church is orderly and has peace about it. It's not chaotic. He's not chaotic at all. So when you understand the background, you can see why Paul has issued such a strong statement for women. This did not seem to be an issue for men in the church in Corinth. Their issue was more passivity and letting it go on. In other words, Paul would say it like this. Women, there's no need for you to talk out of order. Just like there's no need for a man to speak out of order. 
Everything should be done orderly and peacefully. That's one side of it. That's, that's, the, that's the culture. But there's another issue at play here that we have to notice. We've seen throughout 1 Corinthians 14 the importance of authority in the church, especially when it comes to spiritual gifts that speak in the church. Notice how Paul put this in verse 29 and verse 32. Prophecy is to be judged, and so is tongues with an interpretation. It's to be, it's to be evaluated. In other words, what, he, what he's getting at is accountability and evaluation are to take place anytime something is spoken in the church. Listen, at our, at our church, you, this may not surprise you, may not, it may surprise you. When we bring a new song to you, that song has been evaluated by our elder board and by our theological team. And the way Perry does that, he brings me the lyrics first, has me read through it. If I have any questions about it, I pass it to my elders before we've ever heard the song. You know why? I, I like loud music. That's just me. And I'll get excited about what's being sung and will not even notice what is being sung. But to us, we see the evaluation in 1 Corinthians 14 implied and so important, we even take the songs we sing to evaluate them, to, to hold them accountable in this. Now, 1 Corinthians 14 implies something. It implies that there are authority figures in the church that God has put in the church to help with this evaluation. It's people that you would trust. So not just anything is given in the church. It's people that you would recognize. They're recognized leaders in the church. And it's right in the middle or at the end of that section that Paul gives the, the instruction about women not speaking in the church. So you have to ask, what Paul is really saying here, he's, he's, he's dealing more than just chaotic women speaking in the church. Paul is actually speaking about something else. He's speaking about gender order in the church. Specifically, gender order in the authority of the church. Now, two guys that have done a lot of work on this are John Piper and Wayne Grudem, and here's how they address this section of Scripture. This is the best statement on this that I have found that I think will help you. He says this, if all speaking were shameful, then Paul could not have condoned a woman's praying and prophesying. That makes all the sense in the world, right? I mean, if Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, women, you can pray and prophesy, but then in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, hey, ladies, keep your trap shut. That doesn't make sense, right? I mean, we, we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta figure out what he's saying here. But he goes on to say, but Paul shows us in 1 Corinthians 11 that what is at stake is not that women are praying and prophesying in public, but how they are doing that. That is, are they doing it with the dress and demeanor that signify their affirmation of the headship or leadership of the men who are called to lead? In 1 Corinthians 14, 33-36, we notice again that the issue is not the ability or the wisdom of women to speak intelligently, but how women are relating to men. Primarily, in 1 Corinthians 14, it relates to the testing of prophecies and the calling of men as the primary leaders of the church. Women are taking on a role here in Corinth that Paul thinks is inappropriate. And so it's in this activity of public judgment on spoken prophecies that he calls them to keep silent. That's really helpful. In other words, in 1 Corinthians 11 and 14, Paul is calling for not the total silence of women, but a kind of involvement that signifies in various ways their glad affirmation of the leadership of men God has called to be guardians and overseers of the flock. That's really helpful. So just as we notice, and this fits with the flow of Paul's argument, because just as we notice the order of, matters to God in the church in the very first point of our sermon, here's what you're noticing here in the church. The reason order matters to God is because it reflects the character of God. And we see the exact same thing here in gender order in the church. Now in the church, our governing documents are the Bible. And God is the one that has spoken these things. Therefore, we can't 
just do her own thing, which we'll talk about later. But according to 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Timothy 3, God has called men to lead his church. Women are not to teach or exercise authority over men, and elders or overseers are called the husbands of one wife. Now listen, you've got to do some serious word gymnastics, serious cultural gymnastics to make this not say what it says. And again, I, I'm not trying to be tried here. I didn't write this. God did. And the reason Paul says in that text why God did it is because is order. He created man first and then woman. Adam first, then Eve. And here's, if you've been here for very long, if you're new with us, you're going to hear this for the first time. I say this so often, I bet I've said it a hundred times or more in the last seven years in our church. In God's economy, men and women have equal value, yet a different role. And that role is to complement one of her supremacy, they are enjoying and complimenting one another because the strengths of men are not the strengths of women and the strength of women are not the strength of men. So God has put us together in the church to reveal something unique to the world around us. See, it's, it's equal in value, different in role. Now what's fascinating is in the discussion on spiritual gifts, what have we seen? Well, God has given all of us a different role, a different gift, but we're equal in value. In the same way that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have, have different roles, but they were equal in value, equal to worship. Yet when it comes to the gender roles, we get really wigged out. Like, hey, stop, man. Don't, don't you tell me my place or where I should be or what my role is. Wait a minute, but what if I told you that that's not your gift? Oh, that's totally fine. It's just not my gift. But you're a dude. This is what you should be doing. You're a lady. This is what you should be doing. Don't you dare step over. Stop. If equal in value, different in role. So what we see at the end of 1 Corinthians 14 is that gender roles in the church matter to God. Now, again, just think how crucial this is to us right now, right where we live. And this is a very general statement that I'm going to give you, but I think you'll find it to be generally true. That's what I'm giving it to you, okay? Churches that tend to ignore order in the church tend to ignore gender roles in the church. I'll say it again. Churches that tend to ignore order in the church tend also to ignore gender roles in the church. But I think we can safely and biblically say if order in the church service matters to God because it reveals the character of God, we can also say gender roles in the church matter to God for the same reason. You know why? You see authority. You see order. You see submission. You see love and disagreements. What do those things reveal? They reveal equal in value, different in role. And what that does is it says something to the world that is so confused about gender and the role that gender plays in our lives. What's very fascinating in Genesis chapter 3 is the moment sin enters the world, you immediately see a conflict between man and woman. It's a battle for supremacy. And friends, I, you, I don't have to give all the headlines for you to, for you to look around your world and see that going on everywhere. See, when the church compromises on gender roles in the church, it's setting a very dangerous precedent, and it's giving compromising testimony to the world around us about the power of Christ. See, what we want to do in the world is we say, let's change our gender because we don't like it and show the power of Christ. That's what we do in the church. No, no, no. What the Bible says is, no, the power of Christ changes us to see gender radically different. Now, John MacArthur put it like this. He says, God has a plan. Husbands are to love and to lead. And you've got to put those two together. Love and lead. Not dominate and lead. Not overdo it and lead. Not dominate and lead. Love and lead. 
Wives are to submit and respond. And God wants that order made visible. Because it's an order out of his character. And he wants his, I mean, out of his nature. And he wants his nature manifest in the church. And where that doesn't exist in his church, you have violated his order. What a scary thought. And you have violated his nature in terms of revealing it. See, as we saw in our study of 1 Corinthians 11, if we deny men and women's roles and genders in the church, the logic says we must deny the submission and authority in the man-to-God relationship and in the Christ-to-God relationship. This is so radically serious, it's a gospel issue. And so you might go, okay, then what do we do in the church then? I mean, how do we live this out? Because, I mean, good grief, you look around your world and you go, I mean, the, the pace of this thing is so crazy. What do we do? Well, I can tell you some things not to do. And I'll tell you some things to do. First, you need to get the yuck factor off your face. You got to get rid of the fact that you're going, I'm just so disgusted by this lifestyle and the way they do this. And give the, you got to change that on your face. Let me tell you why. What do you expect sinners to do? Well, I expect sinners to act like me because I have the power of Christ in me. Sinners don't have the power of Christ in them. Sinners are going to sin. And so therefore, they're going to do everything they can to push their own agenda. What do sinners need? They need to see the power of Christ so uniquely lived and proclaimed. So listen, we've we, we got to stop yelling at people. Got to stop getting mad. Got to stop talking over the top of them and saying, this is, the, this is the gospel on display. No, it's not. You're just an angry jerk. So now I'm proclaiming, the, I'm a prophet, I'm preaching the gospel. Well, you're also a jerk, right? Can we have the spirit of love come out of you? Well, that'd be awesome. So don't yell, don't get angry, don't look disgusted at them, or listen, or act put off. The best we can do as a church And let me tell you, CLF, you do this really well. It's function in the gender and role that God has given you. You don't declare Christ to a world filled with gender confusion by compromising on gender or or condemning those who have that confusion. You declare Christ to a world filled with gender confusion by living joyfully, eagerly, lovingly, and respectfully in the God-given gender that you were born with and revealing that to people around you and then declaring to them the glorious news of Jesus that has saved you from being confused about your gender as well. In the church, God's calling men to be men, strong men. Just a word, you'll notice in the text, it has something really interesting. It seems to be that women could joyfully go to their husbands and ask questions and they would give them answers. Can I just give a little tip to those of us been CLF for a while? The last two years at CLF, our theological classes, which we do regularly here, have had hundreds of people that have gone through them. The last two years, we've had more ladies than men. Dudes. Figure it out. Right? Show up, be men. Grow in these things, understand these things, because here's the deal. If you want strong women, you better have strong men. And if you want strong men, you better have strong women. And the beauty is, in the church, this gender order, the gospel, here's the power of the gospel. The gospel solves the gender conflict. Now let's close with the last point, which is, as in all the churches, The Corinthian church honestly believed that they had the corner of the market on spirituality and they could come up with and make up all the rules as they went along. You'd be shocked by this, but there are pastors that I visit with and they just go, I don't see what the big deal is about. I mean, we can do whatever we want to do. I'm like, dude, I don't mean to be weird about you, but God has given some rules. He's given some commands. The Corinthians were the same way. They thought their overly giftedness gave them super spiritual status, and that meant that they could do whatever they wanted in church. But notice what Paul says to them at the end of verse 33, and it's just a little phrase that connects the previous, all the previous section and then to the last section. 
as in all the churches of the saints. Meaning this, no church like this one or the church in Corinth is free to make up our own rules. We're not free to do that. We're not. These guidelines for order are in all the church, to be in all the churches for all time. No matter what the cultural barriers there are around that church, there's to be order in the church. And Paul gives reasons for it with these rhetorical questions. I mean, the word of God didn't come from us, meaning you didn't write the Bible. Did you? Uh, no. Are you the only one that the gospel came to? Well, no, it actually went all around the world to different churches. Okay, then why are you thinking so highly of yourself? And if you don't recognize the word of God and be in submission to the word of God, his point is, you're not worthy. You should not even be recognized. You talk about a rebuke. Hey, Corinthians, you don't want to get into the order that God has given you? Guess what? You're not even a Christian church. A.C. Thistleton described the situation in Corinth very well like this. The church in Corinth so often wanted to go it alone in theology and practice. Paul asked, did a local church produce the word of God on its own or found the gospel? Big dummies, in a sense. Can a local church invent or reshape the gospel? No way. If it derives biblical and apostolic identity from Christ and from sharing with all of God's people, how far can it invent its own rules even to address a local situation? How far can a church or an individual go it alone before it loses recognition as a Christian? Now again, let's just think about how important this is for us right now. It doesn't matter what denomination you came from. It doesn't matter what theology you buy into or what you personally like or dislike when you come to church. God has commanded there is to be a certain order and peace that is to be maintained when the church gathers. Now, this doesn't mean that all church order is going to look the same. Church structure will look the same. Some people I know of, they love two songs, then a sermon, then communion. Some love to sing choruses. Some love to sing only hymns. Some like to quote certain prayers, and there's some that really want a procession of flags going in the church service, right? I mean, I've had some of you say that you like that jokingly, and I, my response has been, no, thank you, we love you, right? Some like communion every week. Every week, let's do communion. Some say, can we just do communion twice a year so it seems special? But here's what Paul's told us in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. Order, peace, things spoken clearly, and each in their own turn reveal the God of order, and that is of utmost importance to God. There's to be diversity of roles, working in unity, just like we see in the Godhead. There's to be authority and submission on display, just like we see in the Godhead. There's to be gifts being used to edify others, just like we see in the Godhead toward us. There's to be love revealing the God of love and his power at work in us through all of our disagreements. But here's the point, we're not free to make up our own rules. See, what, what you notice as you go through 1 Corinthians 14 is when you come to church, your mind is on God and on edifying other people. Ultimately, coming to church isn't, you know, boy, I really hope that preacher gives me something I can take home today. No, 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 no. You're coming to church to glorify God and to edify other people. And when we come up here on the pulpit to display what we're doing, we're giving you every Sunday a touchstone to say, there is Jesus, I need to worship Jesus, and I need to bless other people. Church is ultimately not about us. It's ultimately about revealing God. See, so CLF, listen, it's our joy to lead you this way. But more importantly, I've got to be honest with you, it's our responsibility to lead you this way. It's God's church. <laughs> you are the people for whom Christ has died. We do not have the authority to change the rules. He's the chief shepherd, and he's the best pastor of his church. And our job every week is simply to tell you, you have a pastor who is so great and glorious and good and omnipresent so that when trouble hits you and the pastor can't get there in time, you've got Jesus. That, that's what this is about. 
church is ultimately about God. So why do we do the things that we do? Because God has said. Every week, we want to be faithful. I've said in the early service, we want to lay down a faithful sacrifice bunt. We want to get a single every now and then. We're not looking for grand slams. We're looking for good quality at bats that move runners, that score runs. That's what we're looking for. And every week, we simply want to say this, one Sunday, we're faithful. And the next Sunday, we're faithful because success in Christianity and in the church is long-term faithfulness to God. Let's pray.